to introduce microbial ecology. So uh, let's talk about bacteria. Uh, they are all around us all the time, and yet these are things that we don't really think about. If you were to take a cubic meter of air um, around you, so uh, a meter is going to be about as long as your arm, and so imagine making a cube out of you know, your arm <laughs> several times. That much air would have about 100,000 bacteria on average. They can be up to around a million bacteria. Uh, in it, and they will just be a random sampling of whatever bacteria there are in the area. So you'll have bacteria that normally live in the soil, bacteria that normally live on the walls, or particularly if you're around people, you'll have uh, bacteria that uh, find people a good place to live. So here we go, let's learn about them. All right, so bacteria are found in lots of different habitats. Let me just uh, make this a little bigger. Let's see, we want to do full screen. There we go. There we go. Okay, and so this is a presentation that I've taken from a, um, a professor called Odder Wilhelmsen, and he's at the University of Akureyri in Iceland. And uh, he's a good guy. We've uh, done some work together in the past, and he's just got a neat way of uh, putting all these things. And so I, I like his slide sets, and I'm hoping that they work for you as well. Uh, this is his youngest son, Ricky, uh, right over here looking down the microscope <laughs> a couple of years ago when he was little. Um, okay, so bacteria are found in all habitats, yeah. So your front yard, a jungle, a rainforest, the bottom of the ocean, doesn't matter where, everywhere that uh, there is life, there are bacteria. And yeah, they are at uh, different levels of temperature, pressure, acidity, um, whether there's ox oxygen present or absent. There are bacteria that are very tolerant of radiation and uh, changes in humidity, the driest place and uh, underwater, you can find bacteria. And yeah, there's amazing diversity. We think there may be something like a billion species of bacteria. And that is when we apply fairly strict criteria about what gets to be a species uh, of bacteria to sort of keep the numbers down. Yeah, and compare that to something like, I don't know, um, a couple million insect species. I've seen estimates as high as 2.4 million uh, for those. And everything else just pales in comparison. So there, there are far more kinds of bacteria on the planet than of anything else. And they make up a huge biomass, uh, 500 billion tons, if you were to get them all together in a great big pile. And uh, yeah, that's a thousand times the biomass of every single human. So if you stacked us up and you stacked bacteria up, yeah, bacteria would be a much bigger stack. So we think there are about 10 to the 30th bacteria on planet Earth. And this number um, comes from measuring the amount of bacteria in soil and in air and in water samples in lots of different environments, and then just sort of multiplying that up over the uh, surface of the earth. There are even some bacteria that burrow into rock for a living, so they are very interesting. Okay, as I said, this is uh, Icelandic focused, but uh, yeah, we can, uh, wherever they say Iceland, you can imagine we're saying Texarkana uh, instead. So yeah, if we were to sample the Earth's human population at random, sampling 100 individuals, what are the odds that we would expect to find somebody from Texarkana, for example, uh, or somebody from Iceland? Um, so on average, you'd find something like uh, 19 or 20 Chinese people, 17 Indian people, etc. da 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 small chance of finding uh, one British person, and uh, yeah, uh, very low chance that one uh, ice, a person from Iceland would be included, very small chance that a person from Texarkana would be included if we just took 100 random people uh, from the earth. And so the problem you run into when dealing with microbial ecology is you will get these lists. You can look at any kind of soil and you will find thousands of bacteria. And it's going to range from about 5,000 up to over 10,000 different kinds of bacteria within a single gram of soil. And if you sample another gram of soil, there'd be some overlap, but there'd be some new things as well. You might find another thousand uh, new kinds of bacteria there. And so when you find all these things, it's hard to know which ones are important. And it's also hard to know, is this um, bacterium that I found, is it something that actually belongs here? 
or is it something that just you know came in off my shoe or just out of the air right now is it not really part of the environment is it just like biological litter something that landed here um and so yeah microbial ecology labs are requiring on are relying on deep sequencing uh, and a thing called metagenomics where you read out all the dna at once in order to try and figure out the real structure of natural populations so uh yeah if you have a small population like imagine you know the population of texarkana is a small population less important and the answer is of course not right yeah <laughs> so uh yeah and the nice example that he gives is that for every lion in africa there's around a hundred wildebeest doesn't make the wildebeest a hundred times as important as lions the two go together it's just you can't have any more lions than that because they rely on the wildebeest it only needs a few lions to basically balance the equation and so um yeah what we know is that we think or rather the logic we're going to use to um, uh, sort of unravel these big stacks of bacterial dna are that we're going to say that autochthonous which means bacteria that are endemic or they they basically belong in this place and they grew up there and they live here on purpose are more likely to be more numerous in any one place than foreign visitors so right so these uh, low amount bacteria may or may not be uh, foreign visitors i guess the question would be can you find one reproducibly every single time you sample soil like this and then if you take it away from the soil does it have any particular effect something like that or the air or whatever else okay another little thing is that bacteria present in very low numbers like one or two copies are probably not going to affect the local environment to a great extent so they may make antibiotics they may do all kinds of things uh, fix nitrogen or do something unusual chemically but there's not if there aren't very many of them they won't have as big an impact um yeah and also of course not everything that uh, you get from a habitat is active uh, it could be uh, sort of resting or like in a um, in a little cyst or something like that um, and it may actually even be dead it's possible <laughs> so that makes it uh, difficult because of course you're just sequencing dna and you can't tell if you pulled the dna out of a living thing or a dead thing because we just collect it all uh, and so this is the inside of a lichen and so lichens are those little scaly things that grow on tree branches and old gravestones uh, for example possibly even on your roof yeah, depending how long it's been since it was uh, refinished and this is showing all the different colors are highlighting different kinds of bacteria so the lichen as far as we know is a collaboration between a fungus and a kind of either algae or cyanobacteria but there's a lot of other little hop-ons that live in there a lot of other little bacteria that seem to make a home in there and so the question is yeah are they important or not important difficult so let's just go we're going to stay kind of broad here i'm not going to get uh, too terribly specific but um, yeah, we've got these terms, niche, habitat, and ecosystem. So these are going from tiny to very large. Um, so an ecosystem is just everything, the environment and everything in it. A niche is a set of constraints. So like my left shoe, you know, front of on a day that is sunny is a particular ecological niche. And there'll be some bacteria that will do well there or better than the others. And a lot of bacteria that just will not make um, be able to grow very well on that. Uh, situation and then habitat is the place in question where the organisms reside the neat thing is this is a uh, model of a little piece of dirt and it's actually drawn uh, based on some uh, scientific results they were able to scan this thing in and what you can see here is that even though this little particle is uh, only about what 12 millimeters it actually encompasses several different niches so on the outside, you have an area where you would get basically full oxygen, so 21%. And as you step toward the center of the particle, there's going to be a bit in the very center of the particle that's actually not going to get any oxygen at all. And so there are some bacteria that will actually die if they come into contact with oxygen, but they could live on the inside of one of these little particles, and they would uh, not be able to live uh, anywhere on the outside. And for each of these little realms, there are bacteria that specifically need different amounts of oxygen. 
and do not do well when the, the amount of oxygen is different. So for each of these areas, yeah, each one is its own little world with its own little uh, atmosphere that the bacteria can live in, which I think is very nice. Okay, a couple other general principles here. Uh, symbiosis and syntrophy. So uh, shown up here is a... Um, uh, this is a group of methane-producing uh, microbial species, so uh, uh, bacteria. And there's actually three kinds here. There's the uh, sort of light ones, there's the dark little round ones, and there's the long filaments. And uh, the one that is the dark one actually needs these other two around for survival. They are in a feedback loop. One is producing a product that the other eats, which produces a product that the third one eats, which produces a product that the first one eats again. And so it's a nice little loop, and so these things stay clustered up. Um, there are even some bacteria that will cluster up for warmth. If you put them in a warm environment, they all just stay apart from each other. But if you cool it down, they will just uh, stick together in a big ball. And uh, it's thought to be just like what penguins do uh, to keep warm there in the uh, Arctic or Antarctic, sorry. Um, anyway, yeah, so uh, you've got parasitism among bacteria, where the parasite benefits and the host suffers. You've got commensalism, where the guest benefits, the host doesn't really benefit, but doesn't really get hurt. You've got mutualism, which is where um, uh, all the participants benefit, and so that's the normal uh, sort of street definition of symbiosis. And you've got syntrophy, which is not symbiosis really, but it's cooperation. Like, for example, if you uh, are one bacterium and you make a particular product that another bacterium needs and then uses to make a third product, then this, this is fine. Both of you can survive on your own, but um, yeah, it gets a little better if uh, the two are together. So, it's a trophy. Okay, so if we're trying to deal with, um, with different organisms in a community, one way to think of that community is in terms of competition, because in a community like a soil community, there's actually relatively little amount of food present there. Uh, plants do a wonderful job of extracting the little bits of organic material that are in the soil, but uh, really, yeah, it's a pretty harsh world. It's mostly bacteria and sand uh, inside the soil. And so um, this, this is the uh, Verhulst model of population dynamics, showing how competition changes different populations. And so the idea that comes from this are that there are different parts of this equation that you can maximize and be successful. So for example, let's talk about these two. So we don't need to know the equation, but that is the equation if you ever want to look at that or do mathematical modeling. This is a simple one, but a useful one. So there are what we call R strategists, which are going to be modifying this R. And so if R is big, that's the rate of growth, then these are basically going to have lots of um, offspring. Uh, and when conditions become favorable, they just dominate. They re reproduce, sorry, really rapidly and just absolutely take over. Um, then over here on the other side, you've got your K strategists. So K strategists are going to have lower growth rates than R strategists because so R strategists are about maximize the rate, have as many babies as possible. This is how we win. K strategists are going to um, adapt to the environment. So they're going to find some sort of energy source that other organisms uh, don't use particularly much. They're going to find their own niche. And so they will uh, spend more energy on these sort of adaptive processes that help it stay in that niche. niche. And so uh, these things would tend to be, uh, yeah, more stress tolerant. Um, and uh, because they are not using the same food sources as all of the rest of the world. So pretty much anything can make a living eating uh, glucose. That's just a real good universal food for everything that's on Earth. But something like a K strategist might, you know, it might be able to subsist on glucose, but everybody's going after the glucose. And if it runs out, then you've got to make do on your own. So a K strategist might use elemental sulfur coming from a hydrothermal vent under the ocean, like a little undersea volcano. And it might use that to power processes. It might use that as a way to uh, make ATP and move electrons around. Something like that. Uh, and so these are both strategies that are viable in the world. 
And the really common things that you find in soil are probably going to be more over toward this R strategist side, and the rare things are either going to be uh, K strategists or things that are dead or don't belong there, most likely. Okay, also consider there's a lot of antagonism in the world. So all these cool antibiotics that we have are actually things that are made by different kinds of bacteria, almost exclusively. And um, those bacteria are using them as weapons. So the bacteria produce antibiotics in order to fight other bacteria, because if you kill off the other bacteria, you can eat everything they're made of, and you get to eat all the food that you guys were fighting over in the first place. And so most kinds of bacteria will have some kind of antibiotic inside of them. It's just that most of these antibiotics are going to be generally poisonous or bad. Uh, and so these would not be things that would work well inside of a human body because they would probably make us sick just like they would make other bacteria uh, sick. But there are a few, a few antibiotics that actually specifically go after parts of the bacteria like the bacterial ribosome, which is a little different than the eukaryotic ribosome. And by doing that, they are able to um, be used in humans because they hit something that we don't need. The uh, antibiotic hits something very specific to the bacteria that is not found in the host. And so, yeah, that happens. Um, and uh, in addition to this, you have uh, sort of, so general antagonism, this is... Uh, producing peroxides and uh, things. Specific antagonism is making something like an antibiotic that will specifically kill off particular competitors. So these are a uh, anti-competitive uh, measure. You just you're, Each bacterium is trying to win by murdering the competition. And you have a lot of bacteria that will actually be predators of other bacteria. Uh, some of these are like uh, Delovibrio right down here. And so these are big E. coli cells and Delovibrio is this little guy and it's going to burrow inside, and then once it uh, is in there, it's going to replicate, use up all the parts of the E. coli, and so here's a little swarm of Della Vibrios inside, and then boom, it's going to burst out. So there's all the little Della Vibrios, and here's our little chains of E. coli, and look at them all lined up, getting ready to go in and do it all again. Uh, Della Vibrio can clean out stuff like E. coli from the soil, which is very neat. So, all right, if you do happen to find a new bacterium, what are you going to call it? How do you name things? This is interesting. Uh, and this is a problem. I haven't ever uh, named a bacterial species, but I've named some viruses, and uh, I'm going to have to name some fossils as well. And there are rules. Oh, my goodness, are there rules uh, for these things. But these are. this is the simplified version. So, all right, the taxon should be named in such a way that it could uh, have a Latin grammatical suffix. And so, yeah, people are wondering, why do you study Latin? Well, it makes taxonomy a little bit easier. Um, generally, the words that are used to make uh, binomial names of living things are going to come from roots that are either Latin or Greek. Those are the most common things. Okay, genus and species need to be of the same gender. So, ah, yeah, because, of course, Latin is one of these languages where you're going to have uh, feminine and masculine um, endings on different words. And so it's not that, you know, an apple is always a uh, man or a woman. I can't even remember which. Uh, I guess it would be male in uh, Latin, yeah. But uh, just that it's going to be treated as such grammatically. Uh, so it's a little weird. But you got to make sure that the two match. If the genus is female and a lot of them are, then you've got to make sure your uh, species name is also grammatically female, um, even if it's named after someone who's male. So uh, fuchsia, the color, comes from a thing called a fuchsia plant. And fuchsia was named after a scientist called Dr. Fuchs, F-U-C-H-S. And so really it's fuchsia. But uh, even though he is definitely male, uh, fuchsia, fuchsia, if you like, is a female name because, uh, yeah, because the other members of that genus had to be female. And that's the way the plants uh, were done. Uh, and so anyway, uh, once you make a genus and a species, you have to assign that genus to families, order, class, phyla, and domains, like so, yeah. And if there is no, uh, you know, if you find a new genus, and it only connects up to a class and there's no order or family that's been described, you have to name the order in the family right there. And so, uh, yeah, there's a lot of names. 
And uh, there's actually probably so many names that people get a little tired of naming and they just say, you know what? It needs to be distinctive. That's the main <laughs> characteristic. So how many kinds of bacteria are there? These are different kinds of bacteria and these are all a phylum level differences. And so you can see a lot of things that uh, are maybe a little bit more uh, familiar. Um, let's see, proteobacteria are here. These are a big famous one, like uh, E. coli is gonna be one of these. Um, and firmicutes, yeah, those are also pretty famous, pretty common. But also you have all these other groups like uh, CP11 and OSK and OP8 and NC10, and there's an OP10 in here somewhere. And these guys, oh, there's OP10 up there. These guys are all phylum level differences. So they're bacteria that live in the world, but we haven't even come up with a good name for the phylum yet. They're just things that somebody found in a paper and gave kind of a placeholder name to. So that's kind of sad. These things have been around for millions of years and uh, yeah, they deserve a name too, don't they? Okay, so um, microbial ecologists are also concerned about m metabolic diversity. This is important. And by metabolic diversity, um, what I mean is that there are going to be different uh, niches, perhaps even within the same little piece of soil. There may be one bacterium that produces a lot of leftover sulfate, and there may be another bacterium that is able to use that sulfate. And so depending on what kinds of metabolism you have, um, there may be an area where another bacterium is producing something that you can eat and then, yeah, bacteria will naturally get together because no energy source goes unutilized on this planet. Something will invade and something will occupy every biological niche um, if it is at all possible, if, if they can like stand to live there. Uh, the only places where you don't get um, bacteria living are places that are hotter than about 121 degrees Celsius. So way past the uh, boiling temperature. <laughs> that seems to be about the limit for uh, human life. But yeah, within any little bit of soil, you can find lots of different metabolic diversity, and these things all work together. They can eat different parts. If a plant leaf falls on the ground and starts to rot, you can have lots of different bacteria that will mine different components out of that plant and turn them into other things to help themselves, but also potentially um, in a way that uh, makes the soil better for growing new plants in the future. Um, so one example of this would be uh, the biogeochemical cycling of sulfur. So sulfur is something that's going to come out of the ground wherever you have a volcano or something like a hot spring. Um, although not much uh, sulfur in the hot springs at uh, Hot Springs, Arkansas, I've got to say. yeah, They're just warm and uh, they're, they're percolating through rock. They're not really uh, volcanic. Um, you know, they're, they're not picking up those uh, sort of volcanic sulfur. Um, anyway, uh, sulfur is going to be converted in between sulfate over here and uh, H2S, which is uh, hydrogen sulfide. And hydrogen sulfide will kill you, but it's also a useful substance because it's easy to move hydrogens off. If you think back to our um, protease lecture in biology one, you remember that once we, we, could, we could pretty easily throw hydrogens off a molecule. And so if you can throw them off, then you can get at the electrons underneath, and the electron is really the goal here. And so, uh, yeah, H2S is used as an electron source by a lot of different kinds of bacteria. And then anyway, at the very end of this, when you've used up all the possible energy, what you've got here is SO4 with two negative charge. This is as many oxygens as you can really fit comfortably around a sulfur molecule and they've got two extra electrons they've stolen from probably hydrogen uh, somewhere. And this is now, uh, yeah, fully oxidized and that's fully reduced over here. And so there are a lot of different pathways. And so there will be all these different pathways, like a sulfate reduction pathway would end up charging up and making some H2S. Or sulfate assimilation pathway would take sulfate and turn it into SH groups on proteins, yeah which uh, cysteine is one of those amino acids that has uh, SH groups, and also uh, methionine has a little sulfur uh, right near the end of it, and so on. Lots of different pathways to move these uh, elements and nutrients around in the environment. And uh, yeah, so there are uh, even particular systems. Uh, one's called a SOX system, 
and that will oxidize, reduce sulfur compounds directly to sulfate. So a SOX is a way to directly kind of extract a little bit of energy from uh, H2S and turn it straight into sulfate. So that's the SOX system. And what they're doing uh, as they're doing that is actually they're extracting some uh, electrons and they're probably going to be using up some water molecules or oxygen molecules in order to do that. Also, there's going to be iron oxidation. Yeah, there are entire ecosystems that run on iron economy rather than a sulfur economy or a methane economy or like an oxygen economy, uh, which is what, uh, what we would operate on. And if you ever see a puddle or a, a little bit of industrial runoff, it looks kind of like this, sort of orangey, brown, and chunky. Chances are these are going to be some of these iron-loving bacteria, iron oxidizers that are going to grow in there. A lot of these things do not require oxygen in order to live. They will use iron to effectively breathe. And they'll be switching iron back and forth from the 2 plus state to the 3 plus state because iron is one of those uh, transition metals and it can do that. It can go back and forth. And so this is a little uh, picture that shows you how you can use iron uh, to basically feed a cytochrome C to charge up an NAD into an NADH which will then, plus the cytochrome A, be used to drive this little cycle. And we're going to spin this proton pump around. The protons are going to come through. And as they do, they're going to twist this, and we're going to turn ADP into ATP. So it's very much like the ATP synthase that we see on mitochondria. Um, mitochondria are uh, related to some of these bacteria, I think would be the easiest, simplest explanation for that. Yeah. And so you can look in the world, and there are iron oxide reducing bacteria. So these uh, jars all have the same amount of iron in there. But you can see that some of these bacteria in the jars have actually mobilized the iron, which is why it looks all cloudy in there. Um, and they've mobilized it and started to use it. And so bacteria spend a lot of their time hunting and harvesting iron. Uh, iron is particularly important for things like E. coli, for example. It has special proteins that go out and mine the iron out of the environment and collect the iron and store up the iron because it needs the iron to effectively breathe, to be able to uh, move electrons around and make ATP. This is how the uh, cell functions. Okay, so in the end, in different areas, uh, even if we're just talking about lithotropic uh, uh, energy sources, which are things that are coming from stone, like from uh, underground, you can actually find these sort of different sites, and at different sites you will have different ranges of what might be coming out. So there'll be areas that are going to have a lot of ammonium in there. There are going to be areas where you're going to get uh, iron sulfide coming right out of the ground, or carbon monoxide is going to be coming from uh, combustion uh, engines, for example, like on your car. And each one of these molecules is potentially a food source for something. There's, there's something out there that can use any food source you want to name, or at least use it for something. Uh, it doesn't necessarily gain energy from it, but it can use it to drive some important process. And so that's the idea, and that's going to be the end of this. I just wanted to give you a nice little overview of the sort of complexity that we run into in the soil. Microbial diversity is fascinating, and it's a topic that is not particularly well understood. And so uh, the next best thing to actually bringing uh, Dr. Wilhelmsen here to talk to you is me trying my best anyway to uh, give his talk to you. And so that's what we've got. Hope that worked for you. Talk to you.